I had very low expectations coming into this past anime season. There were only two shows I had planned to watch, based entirely off of genre and how the posters looked, and I ended up hating both of them. And then I ended up trying out a few more. But let's start with those two first. Koikimo's poster made the show seem like an adult romance, but that ended up only being half true. The story goes, a salary man falls in love with a high school girl after she saves him from falling down the stairs as he's heading to work. I gave the show 10 minutes before dropping it. And a lot of it has to do with its original theming. I'm not saying the grown man falls in love with a high school girl is inherently a bad trope. This is just a series of drawings after all, and if this is your fantasy, then go for it. But it's been done to death, and I've never found it interesting. Believe it or not, there was another show about a salary man getting romantically involved with a high school girl. And this one was even worse! I gave Higehiro until the mid-episode break before dropping it, because it, it was just so bad. This time, the girl finds herself in front of the salary man's house asking for a place to stay. She's lascivious and even asks for sex herself, and the fan service at this point is just way over the top. And when he rejects her offer for sex, the show kind of pats him on the back for it? As if this guy should be celebrated for not raping this underage girl. Anyway, that's about as much as I could stomach before turning it off, and I guess I should give this show a little bit of credit for like going all out with its skeeviness. Quickimo had this like really wholesome veneer, but the core of it was still quite creepy. Whereas Higehiro has no problem showing the creepiness from the start. But if I had to, I feel like I could suffer through an entire season of Quickimo. But Higehiro was so gross, there is no chance I would ever watch that. Those Snow White Notes follows the story of a young man following in the tradition of his grandpa playing the shamisen, which is a traditional Japanese stringed instrument. After a disagreement of some sort with his family, our hero runs away from the countryside and ends up in Tokyo. I ended up watching just the first episode of Those Snow White Notes, and there were a few things that I liked about it. I always like watching young adults struggle through city life, that's something I very much identify with. I didn't think the animation was astounding, but it was good enough to hold my attention, at least for a little bit. But the story moves way too fast in the first episode. I could barely pay attention to what was going on. I also did not like the main character at all. He's like 19 years old and thinks that everyone else around him is stupid and he's the only one with the right answers. And if the show treated him like the smartass he actually was, I might have liked it a bit more, but it kind of vindicated him as the person with all the answers, and I don't know, I'm not really into that. I especially hated the final scene at the rock concert where all these kids gather and they are so shocked to see someone playing a traditional instrument instead of some rock music. As if they're too young and stupid to really appreciate or expand their musical horizons. I really cannot stand shows that hate young people and the things that young people like, and this one does that a lot, so I stopped watching it. Super Cub is an extended advertisement for Honda, but it is also about a young girl living by herself learning independence through operating and maintaining a motorbike. I actually gave Super Cub two episodes, which ended up being one too many. I went in thinking that this might be a relaxing show with a lot of pretty landscapes to look at. But the first episode was not relaxing, it was grey, and it was slow, and there wasn't really a good reason for it to be those things. The characters were boring, I'm not interested in motorcycles, so that aspect of the show lost me entirely. At the end of the first episode, I did like watching our main character stuck at a convenience store, not knowing how to get back home because her motorbike isn't starting. She's left to her own devices, with no other help around her, with only her bike and an instruction manual. I really like watching characters struggle alone through their problems, and I find it super satisfying when they end up finding the resolution of those problems themselves. Watching that at the end of the first episode convinced me that I should give the second episode a shot. But the second episode didn't do it for me either. Backgrounds remained very generic, the character design has no pop whatsoever, I was not interested in any of the new friends she was making. I guess Super Cub teaches me that there's a pretty fine line between relaxing and boring and it doesn't nearly cross that threshold enough. 
At this point, after all of these dropped shows, I decided to look elsewhere, maybe to some sequels that I might have overlooked the first time through to see if there was anything worthwhile that I could watch this season. Fruits Basket has been on my watch list for years now. When I first purchased a Crunchyroll subscription in 2018, Fruits Basket was honestly one of the first shows that I added to my queue. And it has just sat there for years now. I never felt an overwhelming desire to watch it, but I also never found a good reason to delete it from the queue. Until this season, when I ran out of things to watch and finally decided that this was as good a time as ever to get started on the show. If you don't know, Fruits Basket is a remake of a series from 2001 based off of a classic shoujo manga about a high school girl getting herself involved with members of the family that represent animals of the Zodiac calendar. Our hero Toru becomes the linchpin of this family as an outsider, either because she's loved or she's hated. And she becomes the romantic interest of our two main male characters, Yuki and Kyo. I did not have many expectations of this show, but I found the first season really charming. It struck a very nice balance between silly and sincere, even if I didn't care all that much for the supernatural love triangle that was going on. I actually explained the plot of Fruits Basket to my boyfriend, and he was like, oh, so it's Vampire Diaries, and I didn't really have a good retort to that. But I don't think it's as serious as Vampire Diaries or Twilight or anything else that may have an easy comparison point. I like that Fruits Basket recognizes its own silliness and kind of winks at the tropes that it's embodying. It's not as silly as Monthly Girls Nozaki-kun, for example, but it's also not as serious as Chihaya Furu. Both shows that I like but kind of wish brought a bit more balance like Fruits Basket does. Fruits Basket is a perfectly fine show to binge and forget, even if you don't really like romantic shoujo stuff. I didn't really like the second season as much, only because it leans a little bit further into the serious direction and focuses a lot of episodes on characters that I just don't care all that much about. And I'm only midway through the third season at this point, so I'm not going to make a final judgment on it. But as of now, I am enjoying it more, in fact, probably a lot more than I enjoyed season two. So another show that came out a couple years ago and also had a sequel this season was Megalobox. But unlike Fruits Basket, I never really had an interest in it to begin with. I initially wrote it off as boxing but with robots that make the punches harder. Which isn't entirely untrue, but also doesn't paint a complete picture of what that show is about. I watched the first season of Megalobox a couple months ago and I absolutely loved it. I love how this show addresses class systems and attributes much of society's faults to colorism. I loved the aesthetics. They were retro and futuristic at the same time, and the underground hip-hop score really tied everything together. Even though I don't care much for boxing, I do love boxing movies, and I think Megalobox really adds to that tradition of storytelling. And when I heard that Nomad was going to expand upon the story's social themes, I was really, really excited to watch this season. And Nomad gets off to a great start. I was amazed to see that the official episode titles are in Spanish. I initially thought it was a glitch in Funimation's UI, like they were just giving me the Spanish version of the episode instead of the English version, but no, the official titles are in Spanish. This was actually the show affirming that our heroes are Latin American immigrants. And as someone descended from Latin American immigrants, I found this fact so empowering. Watching the show lean into its Latino aesthetics meant a lot to me, even if it got some of them wrong. But this goodwill only lasts for about five episodes, because after that, this show just completely nosedives. Once we get done with the initial subplot at Mikasa Sukasa, Joe kind of goes back onto his main storyline, which just happens to be far less entertaining. Part of what makes the first bit of the show so enthralling is that most boxing sequels will just give our hero a bigger and badder opponent to fight. But Nomad doesn't do that with Joe. At the beginning of Nomad, Joe is alone and drug addicted and years away from his glory days. We don't even know if he's back with his chosen family, we don't even know if he can still fight anymore, and all of that is like really, really interesting. I wanted to see what Joe's contribution to the story post-boxing would have been like, and he does that for a little bit in the first few episodes. And after Chief passes, it would have made a lot more sense for Joe to take up his mantle to be the defender of the squatters. 
but instead he rides away on his motorcycle and continues his story from the previous season. And we get stuck watching the first season of Megalobox again. This time around, our villain is an eccentric CEO who is building technology to improve the physical abilities of human beings, but it comes with a moral dilemma. So it's basically just Chirato from season one. But this time around, Joe's opponent is the prized servant of the executive whose only reason for boxing is to thank the woman who saved his life. So he's basically just like Yudi from season one. Nomad is the first season of Megalobox, but with lower stakes and less excitement. I was honestly so bored with the direction of the show that I almost dropped it 10 episodes in. There were three episodes left and I almost dropped it anyway. The breaking point for me was watching Joe spar with Sachio. It was supposed to be one of those touching reconnections with the father and son figure finally burying the hatchet and coming together, but it honestly plays out like Joe just beating the shit out of a child. I don't know, I was not touched by it. It was actually deeply uncomfortable for me. If Nomad didn't have a first season to compare itself to, it might be a more passable show. But I had such high expectations after loving the first season so much that it made its shortcomings all that much more disappointing. I really do appreciate what this show was trying to do with social commentary. I do think Nomad touches on the nature of migrant lives more than any other anime that I've ever seen, but it honestly just barely scratches the surface on migrant justice, and then after a few episodes abandons those difficult themes for something a lot more familiar and less entertaining. Nomad isn't bad, it's just not as good as its predecessor. It's a 6 out of 10. For a lot of people, the story of this season was shows that presented unexpected success. The only two can't-miss shows from this season were My Hero Academia and Nagatoro-san, both of which I'm never going to watch. But there were also original shows that got rave reviews like 86 and Vivi, both of which I'm never going to watch either. So for me, this season was kind of a bust. Until... Hold on. Let me get my outfit on. Can you tell? I'm a walrus. Okay, so this one's coming with a lot of spoilers, just so you know. Odd Taxi was my favorite show of the season, and it's not even close. I disregarded it at the beginning as just being another anthropomorphic cartoon like Beastars or Bojack Horseman, both of which are legitimately great shows that also had the backing of Netflix to give it a lot of marketing potential. Autaxi didn't have the same hype machine going for it, and so I had to get consistent recommendations from people that I cared about in order to actually start this show. And uh, oh, holy shit, this show. Odd Taxi is about our hero Odokawa and all of the strange passengers that he picks up while driving through nighttime Tokyo. Odokawa is a very blunt and ostensibly antisocial walrus, and as a result, his passengers put a lot of trust in him to share their most private secrets. Word spreads from the police to the criminal underground that Odokawa is a prime suspect in the case of a missing girl since she was last seen in his taxi before she disappeared entirely. Odokawa claims that he knows nothing about it, though there are some hints that he may know a little bit more than he lets on. It does not help that a key figure in this case is a patrolman with connections to the Yakuza who really wants to see Odokawa taken down. And this is before any of the actual plot gets moving. This is seriously an advanced level mystery with some of the most mature dialogue that I have ever seen in anime. We also get introduced to some of the saddest characters I have ever seen on TV. Odokawa's best friend Kakihana is an aging blue collar worker who's desperately looking for a romantic partner so he won't be lonely in his elderly years. Kawasawa is an obnoxious young kid trying to do anything to get Twitter clout. Nikai, though, is an ambitious idol in training who's forced to commit crimes to help appease the hires up in a really, really abusive music industry. And then there's Tanaka, who from now on I will refer to as Skull Mask. We'll get to him later. For the first time since watching, like, Tatami Galaxy, I felt like I was watching a show about adults for adults. It's not trying to impress me with colors and motion. It doesn't lay the plot out for me so I don't have to think about it. This is a very talk-heavy show, and 80% of the dialogue is meaningless, but it's enthralling 100% of the time. 
it's a show that forces your investment and then requires you to figure out what exactly you want to pull out of it as you're watching it. But ultimately, it's just a really, really, really good mystery thriller. I personally am not big on the mystery thriller action genre, but I do have some stories of these that I do like. And my favorite ones of these are always ones that look like they're being set up nicely only to be blown up completely in the end. Some examples of this are Hot Fuzz, The Departed, Knives Out to some extent are all kind of like this. Odd Taxi very much follows that formula of taking the mystery formula and then puking all over it. It is very fun, unless it wants you to get sad, and then it's very sad. Our desperate blue collar worker Kakihana finally matches with a girl on a dating app only for that girl to be an idol in training Ichimura, who's just catfishing him for money. But he's so desperate to impress her that he takes out a heavy loan from loan sharks just to treat her to a nice meal at a fancy restaurant. When he gets kidnapped to pay back his debt, he's more broken by Ichimura's deception than he is from the torture that he undergoes. Except Ichimura's not completely at fault. She was forced to do this by her manager, who at this point looks a little bit more like her pimp. Except he's not completely at fault either because he's just trying to do anything he can to promote the viability of this idol group that he cares so much about. It's all just super sad. And it's probably a bigger commentary on the nature of ambition than the faults in all of these characters' humanity. No one in this show is 100% evil. No one is 100% good. It's just a perfect representation on the human condition. Which is, on the whole, super tragic. And speaking of tragedy, let's talk about Skull Mask. So another pretty big theme of this show is the social internet and how much it affects us in real life. We see this at first with Gabasawa, who is hell-bent on getting as many Twitter hearts as possible. But we see this in its full form with Skull Mask, who gets his own episode midway through the series. In this episode, we see Skull Mask as a kid in elementary school with an eraser collecting hobby in order to gain some notoriety amongst his peers. When this hobby drives him to spend way too much online on a particular eraser, his dad finds out and beats him, which is something that I want to get back to. Skull Mask's childhood hobby develops into a real adult addiction into gacha games where he once again is chasing this particularly rare and ultimately expensive item. When he finally gets this item, he feels the greatest relief possible, only to have that relief completely washed away when Odokawa almost hits him with his taxi. Skull Mask dives out of the way and drops his phone in the gutter. He's able to recover the phone, but he loses the save file on the game and the item that came with it. And if you've ever lost something that precious in your life, you might understand why Skull Mask then goes on a murderous vendetta against Olokawa. Okay, maybe you can't, but the show makes it seem like the most reasonable thing in the world for him to do after that. Autaxi constantly makes us buy into these ridiculous scenarios promising for a payoff, and it does get there, but before we talk about that, I want to talk about one last thing. The show's biggest theme is the cost of ambition, but in my opinion, the show's second biggest theme is the impact of bad parenting. Just about every broken character we meet in this show has a backstory with some sort of parental abuse or neglect. It's most apparent with Skull Mask, but we also see snippets of it with Mia and Nikai though, and then at last with Odokawa. It's pretty common in anime for main characters to have their brokenness explained by parental abuse. But I have never seen that abuse portrayed so vividly as it's done in Odd Taxi. And even then, a lot of the abuse takes place off screen, but it's no less harrowing. Seeing Skull Mask's abuse was heartbreaking, but it did not prepare me for Olokawa's abuse at the end of the show, which was downright horrifying. It was so bad, it's honestly something that I might turn away from the next time I watch this show. But there is going to be a next time, because I feel like there is so much about this show that I did not pick up the first time around. So far, all I've talked about is story, but I feel like this show has also made very, very cool aesthetic choices. The animation is not mind-blowing, but it's very unique, and the colorfulness contrasts with the very, very dark scenarios it has. I saw some people online complain about the CGI cars, 
I don't know, I found them charming. It's almost as if like a puppet master was playing with his toys. I don't know if this was intentionally bad, but I do get the feeling it was more of an artistic choice than a budgetary limitation. Ugh, way too hot. The score is quietly tremendous. You're hardly gonna notice it most of the time. But at the show's most critical moments, it really blasts in your face and really ramps up the tension. I also find that the jokes in this show really land well, and they even serve a purpose at the end. Overall, everything just melds perfectly together, even if the point of the show is disharmony. Odd Taxi is easily the best show of the season, bar none. So I've been gushing about this show for a while, and part of me wants to give it a perfect 10 out of 10, but I just can't do that. And unlike how with Wonder Egg Priority, when I explained that 10s are something that you feel, when I watch a show like Odd Taxi, and give it a 9 when logically it's a 10 to me, I do have some explaining to do. So let's do a handy video friendly list instead of just me rambling some more. Here are my top 5 reasons why Odd Taxi is not a 10. Number 5, the women in this show are weak. There are a lot of characters in the show, there's like 30 with speaking roles, but only 6 of them are women. And the women in the show mostly exist just to serve the men in this show. Whether it be Shirakawa as Goriki's medical assistant and Odokawa's love interest, or the shop owner Harada who's just there to listen to complaints from Kakihana, or the idols there to please their manager Yamamoto, none of the women in this show really exist for their own independent purposes. And the one female character that does act on her own behalf is probably the most evil person in this show. I'm not saying that these characters are bad. Their motivations are very strong and they provide interesting backstories. But you can tell the show is written by a man, because none of the women play central decision-making roles. Number 4. Too many characters with weak connections to the main story. The most obvious example of this is the comedy duo Homo Sapiens, which is a really funny name for a comedy duo considering this show. I really like their story overall and was glad that they were included. But their only real connection to this story is Baba dating Nikaido. And even then it's tenuous because Nikado doesn't reveal any of her trauma to Baba. I think I would have preferred their existence as this show as the unofficial soundtrack to Odokawa's taxi like they served in the first few minutes of this show. Otherwise, their story just kind of distracts from the main storyline. But the prime example of this problem for me is Skull Mask, and uh, he gets his own point. Number 3. Skull Mask has an unsatisfying arc. Skull Mask's episode may be my favorite of the entire show, which makes it so disappointing that his final arc feels a little bit rushed. I don't think that Skull Mask was an unnecessary character, as his revenge plot is the thing that screws up Dobu's heist in the end. But I also found that the likelihood of Dobu being both Skull Mask's antagonist as a child and as an adult a very forced element of this show. And then after Skull Mask shoots Dobu, he doesn't really do anything. It shows him contemplating suicide in the final episode, but after Odokawa launches himself into the bay, he just kinda gets up and deletes his gacha game app and goes back to work? I don't know, Skull Mask had such a strong start and a weak finish that part of me just wishes he was gone from the show entirely but I do appreciate the one episode where he was the key figure. Number two, the show does not do nearly enough with the Odokawa perspective theory. So the Odokawa perspective theory was something that was bounced around online really, really early on in this show's runtime. And this ended up being confirmed by the show in the final episode. Basically, the reason why all of these characters appear anthropomorphic despite having very human characteristics throughout is that we are actually watching this play out through Odokawa's viewpoint. And Odokawa suffered a very, very traumatic injury as a child that makes him see people as animals. I really like this explanation. I think it makes for a really cool twist in the final episode. And I especially like how they completely wipe away his perspective and go for a very new style in the second half of the last episode. But I don't think the show does enough with this. If we're watching a show play out from Odokawa's perspective, we also have the opportunity to ask ourselves about his reliability as a narrator. Like, are there things that he sees from his perspective that end up being untrue because of his own biases? 
but the show chooses to keep these ideas less complicated by presenting it almost as like an omniscient viewpoint from a singular perspective. It's a fine narrative device. I just think it's kind of a wasted opportunity for more. But maybe there wasn't much they could do about that because number one, Odokawa is a boring main character. For a show that seems so mature, it falls into the trap of presenting a main character that's kind of boring and lifeless. So boring and lifeless, in fact, that anyone watching can sympathize with him. I hate, hate, hate this trope in storytelling. It's kind of the reason why I hate video games. I don't want to be a part of the story. I want to watch the story. I do not need a vessel to latch onto. I am perfectly fine as a third person observer. But I also kind of see what the show is doing here. It plays on this idea that taxi drivers are often people that their customers confide in because taxi drivers are a captive audience in an intimate moment that you can easily forget about the minute you leave their taxi. And in order for this to work in the show, Odokawa needs to seem open and willing to listen to his clients. But while the show does that, there's not a single interesting thing about Odokawa that makes me want to root for him. We end up rooting for him anyway because bad things happen to him that aren't his fault and we sympathize with that plot. But ultimately, he's just a normal cabbie, and it's really difficult for me to see why all of these important people gravitate towards him. I don't really understand why Shirakawa develops a crush on him. I don't really know why the Yakuza see him as a trustworthy partner and collaborator. He's just kind of dull, and this problem kept on popping into my head as I was watching the show. Especially since for me, the thing that's often most important with the show is how much I enjoy the main character and their development. My point with all of this is, Odd Taxi is a great show that is not beyond criticism, but it also deserves heaps of praise for how creative and ambitious and competent and charming it is. I think my favorite thing about Odd Taxi is how it starts off as this puzzle that you're trying to solve, but by the end it just dissolves into this complete mess. Because that's how life is. It's messy. And as people, often we crave answers, but sometimes we just don't get them. Oh, God, I love this show. Odd Taxi, strong, strong nine. Probably the strongest nine I could possibly give a show. And if there's anything next season like Odd Taxi, I am very, very much looking forward to the summer. And as of right now, the only thing I think I'm interested in watching next season is Dragon Maid? Maybe something like Odd Taxi will pop up, but it might just be Dragon Maid in the backlog for me. I definitely will give some other shows a shot, and uh, we'll see how that turns out. See you in about three months, I guess.